33% of equity, WhatsApp is one. The remaining founders have 66%. But uh, now what? Let's imagine, what was that founder's job? Let's imagine that founder was CTO. Mm -hmm. And the CTO had 33% and he left. He got a great job offer from Google. Yeah. <laughs> and the salary and the bonus and the incentives are just too great. And the startup maybe, let's say the startup has been running for six months. Things are not going well. They're not going as expected. It's 33%. He doesn't think it's going to be worth much. But he decides to leave and he takes the share with him. Now, the company needs what? What does the company have to do? They need a new CTO. Yes. How many, what percent does he want? For example, yeah, we may want a significant share. Yeah. Where are those shares going to come from? Company one, yeah. Two words. No, two words. It's going to come from everybody, again, unless we have some agreement to the contract. So, example, if he wanted 33%, we would each, all the existing founders have to go up 11% each. Yes. Now, it's true that it's still even, but it doesn't feel even, because the founders that are still at the company don't feel that it's fair, that they have to give up as much as the founder that left. And they also don't feel it's fair that somebody who's not working in the company anymore, not contributing, not working long hours like they are, not sacrificing everything for the company, gets as much as they can. Yes. And guaranteed this is going to create a very bad feeling in this founding team. Now, did the CTO who left, did they do anything wrong? No. Are they a bad person? No. no. They did what they felt was, they did what everybody does, they did what they felt was in their best interest. When they signed on to be CTO, they believed that they were going to stay in the company, but situations changed, mm -hmm. and they had a big opportunity. And, you know, we always say, oh, when you do, when they do the briefing, safety briefing on the plane, what's the first thing that they tell you about the oxygen mask? I need to leave. Uh, they tell you, you got to put on your mask before you help anybody else. Right? So you got to get your own oxygen before you try to help anybody else. So that's what <coughs> this guy is looking at for his own oxygen. That's what everybody does. Now, uh, and is it wrong that he took the shares? It may not even be wrong. I mean, we may feel as remaining founders it's wrong, but he feels as the parting founder, he feels like. He's entitled to these shares because he's the CTO. He created everything. The whole company wouldn't be here except for him. And, and he's entitled to his 33%. So he, you know, we can't even say he is wrong or greedy. Uh, we just say it's human nature and this is what's going to happen. Now, we might try to negotiate to get him to give the shares back. That may work or may not work. But in the end, it's up to him what he wants to do. So this is a, a situation that happens a lot in startups. Yes. And anticipating that this is likely or can happen, we have a mechanism that we can include in our investment terms and our shareholder agreement that anticipates this and mitigates the worst uh, result. So how do we do that? It's something we, we set up a process that we call founder vesting. Mm -hmm. So founder vesting works like this. A typical, uh, typical founder vesting schedule would say, in order for a founder to own their shares fully, they must work in the company for a certain period of time. And this period of time can vary, but typical is three or four years. So let's let's just look at an example of four years. So in this case, we would say the founder earns their shares over four years. 
in the case where they have 33%, they would earn about 8% a year, a little over 8%, 8.25% a year. So after year one, if they stayed with the company for 12 months and then they left uh, the day after 12 months, they would leave with 8.25%. The remainder of their shares would go back to the other shareholders. We usually have in a founder investing schedule, we usually have what we call a 12 month or one year cliff. A 12 month cliff means if the founder leaves before one year, they get zero. So if they leave anywhere from day one to day 364, they get zero. If they leave on day 365, they get 25%. But in case that he already invested money there, he get back this money or zero? Zero. Zero. So, okay. lost so investment is different. Like, um, so, okay, well, if, uh, if founders have purchased shares, yes. normally purchased shares are not vested. The founder shares that we're talking about are earned shares. Earned shares. So if I buy shares, if a founder also is a shareholder through buying shares, then <coughs> normally those shares would not pass. I mean, th those would be immediately over. Uh, because uh, it's a common case in Vietnam. Uh, at the beginning, on others, we have the um, chemical um, like the, the, the priority reference uh, price of others, and we invest money there. And then if anybody left in, in your case, then uh, it's to keep the, the, the So then we have okay, so then we have to decide at the beginning of the company yes. how much of the shares are purchased and how much are earned. In our case, almost purchased. Yeah. But uh, how yes. much do they pay for those shares? That is uh, like the uh, decided the capital of the company. So like it's, it's uh, also it's cheaper than uh, Normal. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if it was my company and I was one of the founders, I would still insist that the purchase shares were only small percentage of total shares. Meaning, you know, the fact that they're getting such a big discount on the shares, the reason they're getting such a discount on the shares is because we expect them to work for the company for four years. And if they, so in this case, in the case where the, okay, uh, we can say, some percentage in a regular vesting agreement, or maybe an agreement like this, we can say some percentage of the shares are pre vested. So, in this case, we would have to agree for the money that was put in, what percentage of the shares are pre vested. Um, because uh, I still think you, okay, if somebody puts in a little money and uh, waves, we all back in the same situation. You know, if somebody, uh, okay, but let's say if founders bought their share at uh, market price in a subsequent money round, then those shares would not be this. But it's, assuming that founders are earning some of their shares, some or all of their shares based on their work in the company, then those shares should be subject to investment. Okay, so for example, we have. Uh, by DPI and agree with the section states how much money you're putting in the company and how much ownership you have. Right? So there's no real discussions of shares at this point. But it does, there must be shares in the company. Well, no, we're limited liability, so at the moment, so there's no shares. We need to have a third investor to make it uh, the joint the company. Only then the term shares will be used. But you can adjust the ownership percentage the same way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you can just make the adjustment based on ownership percentage. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Because actually shares and ownership percentage are the same way. They are. Um, however, how do you deal with the because in a way, all the shares in the are purchased. You put your money in it. 
So that's what I'm saying. Like, if we're gonna, all those patterns are putting in money. Okay, let's say the founders are not expected to stay with the company, then we're not to work. So we just, the founders are just initial investors. It's, 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 like this, right? So one of the founders decided to, to leave, okay? and basically now they wanted to retract some of their investment in the business. Right? You mean they want to take some money out? Yeah. And then the argument was that I was here for a thing like that, and it was like a little or something like that. Right? So, we will take part of the major part of the business investment about it. Why? Because if you see an opportunity, you won't use this money to rent it another customer. This is where all the fighting between the well, so directors of the company started. What happened in that specific company, that guy was in charge of the finance. So that she took the money. So, right. This all could have been voided with an agreement. Yeah. So basically, what we get about, what we learned about kind of customers, we should have an agreement <coughs> up front with everyone who is a founder in the company exactly what they are entitled to or not entitled to if they leave. So there's a, you know there's three ways that people can leave. People can leave voluntarily, meaning they decide to leave. People can be, they can be, uh, they can be well, fired for cause, meaning, and again, this is the, another reason why it's really important to have an employment agreement. Because normally, this would be covered in our employment agreement. So, what happens if I voluntarily, if the founder voluntarily leaves? On this, by this date, or this date, or this date, or this date. So we should have in every founder agreement a length of time that founders need to stay in order to earn all their shares. And I would normally make that as long as possible. Then we need to be very clear about what happens to them, what happens to their shares if they leave uh, at any one of those periods. And depending on how they do. So they leave voluntarily, or they're fired for cause, or they're fired not for cause. So the agreement should cover all three of those cases, and it should cover all the relevant time frames, which is usually less than one year, you know, between one and two years, between two and three years, between three and four years. Fired not for cause. Fired not for cause means they didn't necessarily do anything wrong, but they got fired anyway. Because we want to hire somebody better, or they're maybe not performing, but not like not performance is not that bad. But in in the registration, the owner, the founders already have the share. Yeah. So in the case where so in the case where founders have the shares already, we have we call reverse vesting. So reverse vesting means they must return the shares. So, so it's not that they are issued, and this is actually the most common case anyway. So we, we know that they have the shares already, and if they leave within a certain date, they have to give back a portion of the shares. Now, one situation we might encounter is, they agree to this, they sign the document, but then they don't give the shares back because they just don't want don't want to. Right? Mm -hmm. So, what can we do about that? Is we should have a, a term in the agreement that says, you know, if the shares are supposed to be given back and the founders don't give them back, then they grant what we call power of attorney 
to any to remaining directors to transfer the shares on their behalf. So make sure that even if they don't want to do it, that we can if they we refuse to do it, that we can do it for them. So we can help them to do the right thing. Who keeps track of these shares? Who owns the lines? Who keeps track? Like, um, you mean within the company? Maybe within the company. I guess it depends. They're usually, okay, for example, in Singapore, there's a, something called the ACRA, which is the um, government body that registers all shareholders. So I guess is the, if there's some similar, there may be some similar mechanism in Vietnam. I'm not sure about that. I think, I think it's a whole lot of mess. No. You actually yeah. have to go to court that they can work to shoot us. In the United States, I know one company that is called eShares, they manage tax for all parties. So what happens with the investment bill? Hmm. But, well, but, okay, but let's hold that question in a minute. Um, but definitely, like, even if there's a regulatory body or not that attracts the shares, the company needs to track internally too. So the CEO you know, and the CFO should always know who owns all the shares, how much do they pay, how many shares, and, and might be a good idea to keep the share certificates centrally. You know, uh, so, so, yeah, so that's easy to manage. Okay. But the, your question was about the, the investments, the rights to get out, get part of the investment. But what's the problem here? Well, I mean, I would definitely also have a part of our agreement say no one can ever take any money out of it. Which is what is expected, actually. But it's not what you do. So, but I would, I would definitely put that in the to a shareholder and one of the agreements. So any investor, they invest in and they don't have to money out? No, you mm -hmm. can take money out. There's not like a bank where we only put money in and put money out. Take yeah. money out. Yeah. Be, uh, for example, if the majority of shareholder agree to a bet for someone, it's a, it's a common case that it happened. I believe this. Someone can uh, put more money in second company, but then they don't be said that they don't want to join anymore. And all agree that, okay, we do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> some of the things that they yeah, Chinese. <laughs> yeah, so this is one of it the happens a lot. <laughs> I mean, there's many cases. This is yeah. one of the reasons that we advise you to set up your company in Singapore. Right. Yeah. No, but, uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't happen there. I mean, uh, all right. agree. Majority share will agree that, okay, if you don't want to join, you can find other and he. Uh, share the author with the same price, the author or like uh, in the same uh, position. Mm. But um, we very rarely see that on this report. Like, because uh, the last thing that, um, I mean, okay, let's say normally if somebody wants to get out of their position in the company, then their, op their normal option is they sell their shares to somebody else. Yes. Good. Good. But not so if they can if they can find a buyer for the shares, then great. Yes, but there's so provisions around that one too, I guess. So the trading them in the the founder have a share, even uh if they're not easy to share directly. Yeah. You need to be agreement with the majority. You you can't uh, sell your share in freezes. Mm -hmm. One company that is in freezes, you can sell the buyer. Yeah. So this is uh, good to know. Uh, you know I think, oh, yeah, uh, it's, it's really good to get the blue shirt. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a power share. It's not a power share. It's not a power share. You cannot, uh, cannot share with the share to anyone with the previous. So that's right. You can share to the power share. The power share. Yeah, they cannot, cannot be shared. You cannot share to anyone. Or no, uh, to other. To uh, other. Uh, they can share inside the power share. You can use that to the house side. But this is not that different from normal, from outside shareholders or single shareholders. 
So normally, like, okay, we'll we'll get to this in, in later in the uh, document. But usually there are restrictions on vendors selling their shares anyway, not just here. So I would, it's not a legal restriction, but it's usually a contractual restriction. So in most of the investment agreements, founders will not be able to sell shares outside the company either, or they won't be able to sell shares without offering those shares in terms of first, or they won't be able to sell shares without offering the other investors a chance to sell alongside them. So everywhere we're going to see restrictions on, on founders selling shares. But here specifically for investing, we want to make sure that we want to make sure that all the key people on the management team only get their full shareholding if they stay with the company for four years. And this includes you also. Yes. You CEO. So that's a, something investors are going to and pretty much every investor is money in the system. That case, uh, someone they still stay in the company, but they do part time with the another company. So the in, in official is they still stay. But then oh. uh, in the meantime, this, uh, this is very important. Yeah, the process is very important. The employment, this should also be specified in the employee arrangement. It's a common case. Nobody, you know, they, they should say that all the key employees will devote 100% of their time to this company and not do anything else. Yes. So then if, they, if they, somebody is not doing that, then they can get fired and then they can solve their things. When they are like a director, they can put on them and they will fall them. Oh, so this will also be... The CTO, they can, for example. Yeah, but this is called the governance, corporate governance. So if uh, there's investors in the company, then they're definitely going to make sure that this is controlled. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, you know, if uh, even if somebody is a director in the company, remember we talked yesterday, the difference between shareholder, director, and employee. So let's say CTO is a director. Yes. But if there's a if there's a question put to the board about whether we should fire the CTO. The CTO cannot vote. Only the other directors can vote. Who know who is voting for? I mean, I would guess people would be able to figure out. But yeah, you know, I think there's some <laughs> enforcement may not, may not be perfect. But I mean, let's say if he's working for another company and nobody even knows, then I guess he's doing a good job. Right? So, but. Okay, another question that's going to come up with the founder vesting is um, allocation of the shares. The initial allocation. So, how should we allocate the shares? Not uh, okay. Meaning, uh, in the management team or among the founders, what percentage should each founder have? Mm -hmm. What we did is according to the institute. Okay. It's, a, it's like by subjective, right? For specific company. Yeah. So, but I think there's a couple of rules that we can follow. Yes. I mean, investment is one thing, but I think we should also look at uh, other contribution. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, who, and, and I would look at two things. What has each person contributed up until now? And what will each person contribute from now? In the future. It's a probably the, uh, not some company, but the, some group, some founder, the CTO is some level, it's higher level than the CEO. Like a little game, like he's the main, he's for that person, it's the CTO, but the, like a, the CEO just let me do the level and some sale. So sometimes the CTO is still higher share than the CEO. Okay. Well, uh, I don't think that's, you know, if you have a company that the CTO started the company and then hires a CEO, obviously that's where the company is. So if you start a company that's, you know, you have nothing if you only have CTO and you don't have somebody to CEO. So the, the, the company will work if all the right pieces are in place, not only with some of them. All right? Oh, no, I don't so, know anything, but uh, I mean, yeah. in some case, in some case. Because the um, sometimes the, 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 the technology 
it's very informative. I think the technology. I think the technology is important, specifically over here, in all places. But it doesn't mean that the CEO function is less important. That's what I'm saying. Let's uh, take a little thing. Um, the two founders here, technical, right? And then they hire a team of merchants. And the CEO. And what are the other two founders? They don't become the CEO. They don't become chairman. But this usually happens much later. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, that's, that's a completely different company grows and there's a lot of things change. At the beginning, it's not, I mean, it's not impossible that the CTO would have more shares in some company than the, than the CEO. So I think. It depends on uh, having. I think we we have a clear and uh, yeah, clear and above board and open discussion about how we're going to help the shares and who's going to who's going to do what. So it doesn't look strange to investor. I mean, it's it, it does look a little strange. So usually, normal cases, CEO would have more shares. I there could be some exception case. But uh, I think if the CTO has more shares, you would have to explain. Because another thing is in the startup, actually in the startup, uh, especially technical startup, the CTO may be CEO Wall Street. It's not impossible. That's in my case. No, I mean, I mean sometimes CEO took the, the, the goal that they have to try. I think, I, think, I think in the early stages of the startup, CEO is not just the goal. You know, if you hire a CEO and you know, the company is successful, then maybe you want. 10 years you hire a CEO, yeah, you can have a professional CEO. Mm -hmm. And obviously, his share is going to be much lower than the rest of the main founders. But that's a completely different, uh, it's a completely different story. My, uh, from, the uh, from the beginning, we took care of the top founders. Yeah. In uh, the other two, uh, one is CEO and one is uh, from the technical. Yes. They, they don't have some money, and they said that, okay, uh, we will pull up the money, but the share will be 60%, will be 40% of the other people, of the CEO, the director. Mm -hmm. And then we have, um, we already have the booking for the product development, mm -hmm. and also we have the booking for the business development, for CEO, for me, mm -hmm. the booking, and the timeline for the yeah. yeah, and based on that, uh, we, we we have how to say uh, based on the timeline for each person to and the target for each person to do, that we, we can reconcile each other even so when we visit the target, the target the timeline, very straight, very open. Well, that's the but, and, yeah. And, yeah. and actually, uh, sometimes I think I think the CEO should be uh, the leader and. Uh, so this kind of monopoly, like, 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 I think, like, 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 a company, is not, mean, a, a company is not a democracy and somebody needs to lead, right? That's a CEO. And that means they need to take the, take the tough decisions in terms. Right? It so, depends on how you set up from the beginning of the scope of work, which cost you your pitch time. Well, of course, if, you know, even if there is. It should be based on the respect to the pitch time. Well, of course, everybody has to respect each other. Not but really. somebody, no, not really. they have to respect each other. Yeah. Okay, they're not respecting, that's the key question. That's why, no. But, 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 but I think that uh, not really because I don't think if you see a greater respect, it doesn't mean black and white. No, but no, no, no. no, I don't think that lack of uh, that, uh, you know respect means that you don't make the call or make decisions and others have to accept. Well, so you're wrong. Sometimes the CEO has to do that. Of course, but it doesn't mean disrespect anybody. Sure. Right. To me, yeah, I see. even I, I talk to I talk to everyone, who's, even in the CEO, I say that. Yeah. Okay, in this company, no one is involved in that company. Of course. 
So in case of if you have any problem, you don't want me, just leave. I don't care. I just care about the community. That's all. So <laughs> no single people in here. No, of course not. This company is a group of people. I think uh, it's not one person. Okay. Okay. So this is a point. But let's uh, so let's finish up on investing. I think the last issue I would like to raise on investing is we talked about pre vesting before. Mm -hmm. So if you do have a vesting agreement, one of the questions we might have to answer is how much uh, of the a given founder's equity should be pre vested, meaning not earned over time. And this can be based on cash investment that they made. It could also be based on length of time that they spend in the company before we have the vesting agreement. It can also be based on what other contribution, non-financial contribution did they bring to the company. But to, for me, I would usually try to minimize the amount of equity that's pre-vested uh, because the, the calculation that, or the approach that I usually take is, let's say, What's the value of the company today? Let's let's say for a minute. Let's say the value of the company today is two million dollars. We uh, plan to grow this company to be one hundred million dollars. That means the net value of everything that's been contributed by the founder so far is two million dollars, which is two percent of total ultimate firm value. So. The remaining $98 million worth of value will be created in the future. So usually I think the uh, pre-vested portion should equal, in this case, 2% total for all families. Um, this is, uh, it may sound a little harsh, but you know, in startups, we usually don't care what people did yesterday. We only care what they're going to do tomorrow. But in case uh, uh, when we have that free invest agreement, uh, then the other investor coming in, for example, uh, how to raise the fund, and then how to calculate it to the share of the company. No, no. If the vesting agreement is separate from the founder's shareholding. The founder's shareholding is not changed by the vesting agreement. If the vesting agreement only determines the schedule on which the founders own all their shares outright. So it doesn't change the percentage. Okay, so that's founder vesting. Next, next key term on the economic side is the options pool. Investors, when they come into a, when they invest in a company, they will want to see that the company either has established or will establish as part of this investment, uh, we call an option pool. So sometimes we call this an ESOP, which is employee stock option plan, or ESOS, which is employee stock option scheme, or ownership scheme, or ownership plan. And this is a, a program that the company establishes that creates a mechanism for issuing options to typically new uh, key management team members or key employees. So, in the stock, like in the States, though, if you see the company, it's to every The States will give great stock options to their group. Right? But anyway, the company I've been working for, every employee, was awarded the uh, stock option. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the worth is $1.40 million. Dollars, but the I mean, I mean, here. <laughs> I mean, you could do that. I think it's, it's usually not advisable because the startup has a limited amount of equity to give out, and giving equity to non essential people is probably not. The best use of equity. There's only 100% equity go around. So let's say if we give out equity to, like you mentioned, a cook or you know, not essential staff, it's like, especially. We're not going to do that. But it's as important that 
every we 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 have the best period, and every every we we get, even if it's zero point zero something percent. I mean, for me, I usually advise just the management team and key employees. You will be able to get in front of the rounds. The rounds are going to offer them. So definitely, that's a choice every company can make. But uh, you also, I mean, then you also run the risk of having dozens or scores or hundreds of small shareholders later, which is also not not a good thing for venture funding companies. You did get to the hundreds. Right? That's going to be a good thing. But I think at the moment, it's one of like, you know, although here the problem is that you get not many people know about it. But at the moment, that's the thing that really keeps a lot of the community in police. Mm-hmm. Is the fact that you know they're working for less money than outside, right? I mean, maybe the fact that they have zero point one percent, right? None of them, nobody gets like more than plus one percent. Well, maybe the first two, some of those. But we allocated ten percent, for example. So I guess you decide that every every employee in the company is key employee, and therefore you want to deal with the option. It's okay, right? Okay. So let's say, but normally you would want to focus on the key employees. So if somebody, so you're you're trying to retain everybody, so therefore they're all key employees. So then you have to, usually you know, we'll have to make that determination. Is this employee somebody that we definitely need to retain no matter what, or is it somebody no? So, uh, to class the stock options also, once they're awarded, although they may not be vested yet, um, then we have to account in the stock option plan what happens to options if employees leave or get fired. So, the normal, okay, so now we have to think about how big should the option plan be? I have allocated 10%, and we can buy sometimes they get 15, 20%. Mm-hmm. Well, probably. So the size of the plan should be such that we account for all uh, mm-hmm. all key hires, management team or key employee hires over the, at least through this funding round and maybe for the next funding round too. So yeah, somewhere usually like somewhere between 10 and 20%. Yes, it depends on how many people we think that we're going to need to hire and how much I can be there. So, so this is this pool can be built. So the option pool normally is going to be diluted along with everybody else. But the, another question that comes up when you're establishing the option pool is, will the option pool be established before or after the investment? Uh, how much I can before? After. Okay, the way we did it in the contract, we told them that it's subject to negotiation with investors. So, even the percentile that they've got awarded, right? so what we have, we have the intention, but by the time we, we negotiate with investors, we have an agreement that we just can't change. Because at the moment, we are a little liability company, we cannot even provide any chance anyway. But even if we could, that's probably one thing that we would have liked to keep open, which, by the way, created issues about resting periods and when it starts. And we also have an issue with, uh, because they don't buy the shares, we award them the shares, as opposed to Silicon Valley where they buy the shares, the options. Um, Yeah, so that's something that we actually keep it specifically open until we're going to get the investments. But you already allocated the percentage, ten percent. Right? Yeah. So, so in our plan, we raise the state, but we have ten percent allocated. So, if you do, if you do that, okay. Yeah. So, which is more favorable for the company? You set up the plan before or after the investment? After. The more favorable for you is after, because then the investors will also be diluted by the plan. If you set up, I mean, it's okay to set up the plan before. But if you said before, then only that is your value. So if I, let's see what I'm saying, that the stock options at the moment, okay, uh, 
what we said is okay, at the moment basically only me and my partners will only do business. And what I'm saying is once we get the investment, our everybody, 10% will be awarded by us, basically, right? To the employees. That sounds okay. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean? I mean, the ten percent is going to actually be awarded. It's a pool, right? So it's, it's allocated. Yeah, it's already allocated now, and uh, it's already established. Then. Yeah. Well, that, is, that we can't establish it anyway legally because we're not a uh, joint stock company. So if you're going to do that, it's good to it's good to have the ten percent calculated after the investment. Yeah. So that's what we did. Okay, so that's option four. Um, By the way, okay, so just a question. Um, so, if you use stock option plans like in the States, right, you actually have to buy. You have to pay for the stock options, right? Here in Vietnam, it's, it's not going to be possible to do in most cases. Unless it's really key employees. You know, employees can't afford to buy their, their options. So you can do it. What is the take on that? I think they're not okay. They're going to be okay. Well, okay. it's important to know because if you pay, you basically the company get more money because the employees pay for you. So, I mean, if, if, we, if we have paid. And then since in court, they're usually paying like to be these many men. Yeah. They're paying like what they so that is count month. No, but you would be usually like paying like one one hundredth of a cent per share. Hundredth of a cent? Yeah, whatever the smallest allowable mm -hmm. is. Ah, oh, actually you're right. Yeah, in the States as well. We pay like uh one cent per share rather than one dollar. So it's like the um, you know the amount that the company receives. Okay, option four. Next, anti dilution. Anti dilution protection. So, oh, powder. Uh, okay. Is it a correct powder, right? No, it's oh, all oh, investors. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah. No, so it basically said it doesn't really matter what happens, I'm still going to keep my same percentage. No, this shouldn't happen either. So, okay, so anti dilution. Did, uh, did we talk about dilution yet? So what's dilution? Is it like uh, you have many uh, subscribing investment? investment? So they'll share if the person is your share is increase. Yes. So the the way that equity investment works is whenever a new investor comes in, they are issued new shares. The new shares that they are issued increase the total number of shares in the company. Because the total number of shares in the company increases, the relative share of the company that's held by the existing shareholders goes down. This is called dilution. And this happens every time we raise funding. So whenever we raise funding, existing shareholders are diluted. So is this a, is this a good thing or a bad thing? But hopefully you raise enough so it's going to actually go up in value. So, <laughs> yeah. so is, is it good or bad? Is it a good thing if in the yeah. background increases value? It's generally yeah. it's a good thing yeah. because why would I say generally it's a good thing? Um, because if we're not getting that, it means we're not raising money, <laughs> and if we're not raising money, then we're going to probably die. So we expect to get diluted. So. Expecting, you know, expected dilution is not a bad thing. Investors also expect to get diluted. So, anti dilution protection does not protect investors against what we call normal dilution. Normal dilution occurs when the company raises investment or sells shares in a subsequent funding round. At a higher price than the investor paid in the previous round. Mm -hmm. So as long as the 
share price goes up in between funding rounds, that is called normal dilution. And anti-dilution protection will not apply. So yeah, so if somebody, if an investor comes in with a, with a proposal that says, I am never diluted, that is not, that's not standard anti-dilution protection. That is um, unacceptable. So you should never make a deal with an investor who will never be diluted. However, uh, venture capital investors may ask for anti-dilution protection. This means that if the company raises money in a subsequent funding round at a lower price than the previous round, now, or at a lower price than the investor paid for his shares, now the investor will be diluted less than they normally would be. Because they will, yeah, because, yeah, why? So, why would the investors want this type of anti dilution protection? I mean, let's say, what would be, you know, if I want to, if I want to make an argument why I think this should happen. But the bottom line is, you do the people. So, <clears throat> So two things, right? One is, okay, the, the the valuation at which we invested was based on what? We, we talked about this in the Your forecast? Representations from you. You supplied us with the financial forecast and the business plan, and you assured us that you can execute this plan, and therefore we agreed on this price. However, and, and that was agreement one. And agreement two was, you're going to increase this price for the next round. You are going to, uh, you're gonna grow the company and, uh, and you're gonna increase the valuation next round. So now apparently both of those things were not correct. The original valuation was probably too high. And in fact, you haven't raised money at a higher valuation than that. Now you have to go out and raise money at a lower value. So you sold those shares at too high a price. Now, therefore, investors will not be diluted. Proportionately, now, there are various formulas that we can use to uh, apply anti-dilution protection. The different formulas result in different degrees of investor reduction of dilution. So if an investor wants anti-dilution protection, we also, we must understand what form of anti-dilution protection do they want and what is the impact if we raise money at a lower valuation or sell shares at a lower price in the subsequent funding. Mm -hmm. So that's the point. Yes. Why is the people not to figure this So for me, like normally I wouldn't worry too much about anti dilution protection as a founder. Although founders can be nervous about this, but you know why why don't worry why would I recommend don't worry about it so much? Yeah. Because the effective value that they get, get, get from the company has a business money and a valuation. It's like another valuation. Would that have any more else? Like, let's say, okay, how do you avoid, how do you avoid um, suffering from the effects of anti dilution protection? Do your job, do your research, make sure that you just, know, know. Yeah, just, avoid, just avoid a down round. So if you never have a down round, then you never are affected by anti dilution. So all you have to do as a founder is don't let the company use a down round. The valuation may be affected and it wasn't for profit. Yeah. Say again. 
like uh, when you raise some money and uh, the because of the person in the middle of the but the shareholder, the cover, and usually they may last a couple of years. Maybe depends on the Mostly, first round of the, of the seed class, um, we were raising over 50%. Uh, so, that's a little small amount of reason for children. Well, that, there's a very, that's a very important point. Like, we should, so I'll make a couple of comments about that. One is, yeah, we should not give up more than 50% of the company in any one funding round, including C grant. However, we will, at some point, we will give up more than 50%. Because assuming we raise like three or four rounds of funding, and each investor wants 20%, that means we're going to give up more than fifty percent. But actually, it doesn't matter that much in most cases. Why doesn't it matter that much? Because when we get to control provisions, which is the next section in the agreement, we're going to see that many of the rights that majority shareholders have in a company become much less important when we have a venture capital investor, because why? I mentioned yesterday that venture capital investors will invest in the form of preferred shares. And these preferred shares will have rights attached that basically limit what the majority shareholder can do. So many things that the majority shareholder could do, they will no longer be able to do because they'll be limited by the investment agreement. So one of the Actually, one of the most important aspects of the control provisions in the investment agreement is to block majority shareholders taking actions that are that are or would be detrimental to the minority shareholders. So, so uh, yeah, the point that you made is even the CEO of the company when raising funds, that the definition from the VC is uh, they come in, they also want to take the, the benefit of the profit from the effect investment, not coming to take control of the company. Oh, but yeah, investors, like, although they won't take control of the company, but they will require some control. And we're going to look at, we'll look at what are some of those control terms in the this is unlike angel investors. Some of them may try. But you can both them. Yeah. Some angel investors yeah, might want invest. a lot of control. Some angel investors might take even ordinary shares. So angel investors can run the gamut from just take ordinary shares and get no control to they want to own the company. But venture capital investors are pretty clear. They want to be a minority shareholder. They don't want to control the majority of the state. And they don't want to control most things that the company does, but they do want to control some things. And things that they, okay, so uh, if it's a good venture capital investor, the things that they want to control should only be actions that the company or the shareholders might take that affect the rights or the value of the investor shares. And I'll go over specific examples of that in a minute. Okay, and the last, you know, our last economic term is called pay to play. And pay to play means that in the case where there is an anti dilution clause, it's uh, this pay to play clause often goes along with the anti dilution clause, which says if there is a funding round in the down round, and if the investor exercises their anti-dilution, they must also participate in the down round, meaning they have to join this down funding round. If they don't join the down funding round, they lose their some or all of their preferred share rates. So they have to invest in the down round? Yes. So if an, if an investor is pushing you for anti-dilution, you, you can agree and then say, but we should have a data play provision as part of the anti-dilution. Now, okay, one other economic term that, that you may encounter that I didn't include here 
is called redemption. Yeah. Redemption. So when we, we talked about the uh, investors, venture capital investors will invest in the form of preference shares. Now, these preference shares are also convertible. So we're going to see over here that the um, preferred shareholder has the right to convert their shares into ordinary shares. Sometimes invest, venture capital investors will want redeemable convertible preference shares. So convertible preference shares we call CPS and redeemable convertible preference shares we call RCPS. If an investor has a redemption clause uh, in their shareholding agreement, it means that the investor can, after a certain date, uh, put the shares back to the company, meaning uh, force the company to buy back the shares at some pre agreed price. That's called redemption. It sounds like something we've talked about before, right? So, um, Redemption is uh, not, mm, not that common in Southeast Asia venture capital, but it does <coughs> some investors will want this. And the pump. For the link, I think it's either commonly used by end of this. So, what can we provide that to this? Yeah. So, like, uh, usually entrepreneurs don't like redemption clause, clauses. Because it makes the equity sort of like that. You know, the fact that the investor can sell the share back later makes the not really straight equity. But I'm also usually, one of the reasons I don't list redemption here as a key term, but I'm not that, I'm usually not that concerned about redemption from an entrepreneur or a company side. Because why? Because it's very difficult for investors to actually redeem shares. Like, let's say redemption, the redemption period has arrived, and now the investor wants, tries to redeem the shares, but the company doesn't want to redeem. So, it's pretty hard for the investor to force the company to redeem the shares if they don't want to. They can go to court and they can tell them that they don't want to pay for the company. They're forcing to redeem. I mean, because the, the company can just argue they don't have the money. Yeah. Every redemption clause is going to say that the company needs to redeem out of available cash. So usually, if companies don't want to redeem, they just say they don't have the cash. Okay, so that's that's economic terms. Before we move to control terms, let's take a break. So now it's 4.40. So we'll resume at 5 o'clock to go through the uh, Control provisions in the investment agreement. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I'm going to talk now about the control provisions in the typical venture capital investment agreement. And this is, a, I think, a part of the venture capital investment that a lot of, a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs are uh, quite concerned about. And they, they may even hesitate to get venture capital investment because they're worried that Investors are going to take control of the company. I think this is definitely it's a valid concern and something that needs to be taken very seriously. However, uh, professional venture capital investors should not attempt to take control of the company. If you have an investor that's looking to take control of the company, then that's uh, not a good investment. But at the point where the investor wants to take control of the company, you know, we call this an exit, not an investment. If the investor really wants to take over the company, then they need to buy all or most of the company to take control. Mm -hmm. uh, typical 
a professional venture capital investor will only uh, take a minority stake in the company, but because they will be minority shareholders, and because majority shareholders typically have uh, a lot of rights in the company compared to minority shareholders, investment agreements from venture capital investors will contain uh, mechanisms that enable the investor to control actions that the company might take that are detrimental to their interests. So this is where we see a, the distinction between a good control and bad control. So bad control is an investor that tries to take over operational control or strategic control or decision-making control of the company. Uh, good control is uh, venture investors who attempt to control only bad actions that the company might take. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's look at how that works and what are some of those actions. The first mechanism that the uh, investors will have to control is that venture capital investors will, will uh, almost always require a seat on the board of directors of the company. Now, why do they do this? Or why do they want the board seat? Because many important decisions that the company makes either are approved by or originate on the board. So venture capital investor directors will need to be included in all important decisions that the board might take. So all board level decisions. Sit on the board of all the companies. All the all the decision making will have to work with you. That's why they have many companies. You know, this, have <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a real consideration when you're when you're running a venture capital fund and trying to determine how many companies you want to invest in. One of the factors is your capacity to serve on the number of boards that you have. So, but most, uh, I mean, most venture capital investors would not invest in venture companies unless they were a pretty big company. So usually a typical partner in venture capital fund is maybe sitting on five to 10 boards at a time. So they only invest in 10 companies? Per partner. Yeah. So for example, in our company, we have five partners. Well, so if we have five partners that consist on five boards, we can make 25 investments at any point. So does the partner make the investment decision or the whole investment company will make the investment decision? So in, in, in the venture capital fund, the investment committee makes the investment decision. Usually the investment committee is made up of all the partners. So in our fund, we have five partners, therefore there are five people that sit on the investment committee. And every investment decision is decided by a vote of the partners. And then each partner would then go and then manage the 10 companies. Depending on the number of companies, yeah. So, okay, so this investor director will have special voting rights. Normally, okay, for most boards, the vast majority of decisions are passed by majority vote. Mm -hmm. This is one important thing to keep in mind when you build your board, you, you always want to have an odd number of board members. Uh, one, three, five, seven, nine, okay. You don't want to have even number, two, four, six, five. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And the reason is, it's much easier to avoid tie vote. Never found a heavy season. Yeah, this, so if we if we have to have an even number, we will have a tie breaking mechanism. You know, we'll say in the event of a tie, the chairman breaks the tie or something like that. So it's possible, but easy, most simple is the majority vote and we have an odd number of board members. So typically, startup board will see like three or five. What about one vote for members? Um, what? Is, is that a problem in this age or just, just much later? Or? 
and also being an observer. Huh? Observer. No, no, no. Okay, so you may have uh, some members that they vote for you know, right? Something like that. Yeah. Um, I would try to avoid that. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I would try to avoid any conversation. <laughs> so, we, so we keep it simple in, in this stage. I would try to keep it as simple as possible, and I would try to keep the keep the board relatively small, so we probably don't need non voting members or observers now. So, okay, sometimes <laughs> some investors might want an observer seat. Then we uh, might have to consider that. But I would limit the participation on the board to uh, management team and investors. Now, okay, at some point you might have to add independent directors because of investor requirements. But uh, be careful about, for example, giving out board seats to advisors. Advisors don't need to have board seats. Advisors can uh, be compensated in better ways. The board is actually very, very important. How would you compensate the advisors? So if they're really, okay, if they're really important, I would look at them for some options. May I ask that the more the directors are uh, uh, checked by the company this season, or shareholder agreements, the board directors. So, what was the question? The board of directors, or who sets up the board directors? Or who decides, yeah. right? Yeah. So, uh, initially, the, when the company is, okay, usually, again, I'm not sure if you know, but in Singapore or US, when the company is set up, there's the company appoints the original initial directors. Yeah. Then, and after that, uh, then, Usually there'll be a election for a board of directors every year uh, to elect either elect a new board or you know to re-elect the current board. Um, the election is by the shareholders. Now, but uh, investor directors will not be able to be removed by shareholder votes. So that that's one of the rights investor directors will have. They will not be able to be removed. And also, unless the investor chooses to move them, and also, investor uh, investment agreements will not allow the company to change the size of the board without approval by investor director. Uh, maybe it's a different term, but uh, I think, for example, in um, in the Vietnamese economic law, they have if the share or uh, investor have the share uh, more than ten percent, we can um, send. One to the to the more very yeah, is it something like this, right? Yeah, uh, okay. This is different. That's why we only have more than ten percent investor. So how much control will the board of directors get to make this make this decision? So yeah, so let's look at what are the we'll look at what are the things that the board can do. And we're also gonna look at let's take a look at a typical list of what types of ac actions will need to be approved by um, by the investor director on the board. Just a question in terms of uh, company directors in the board. Um, if one of in the literature about basically the only management member of the company that needs to be on the board is actually the CEO. What's your thoughts about that? Um, you mean when? When? Yeah. I mean, what point of the company? <coughs> it's usually at the beginning. Like when you form a board of directors. Oh, I mean, definitely you have to have more than the CEO because usually at the beginning there's only going to be a management team on the board and then you would just have a one person to board. And then, uh, I mean, I would, I think you want to, uh, you know, you would want to put as many, and um, you, know, you would want to have as many seats uh, on the board to under control of management as you can. As man as a man. Because it gives part of the company. To the management team. Because later what's going to happen is all the new all the new directors that get added are going to be um, investors. Okay. 
Okay, so so this is a typical term sheet. So here we see like board of directors. So we'll have X directors elected by majority of common shares and Y directors elected by the majority of series A. So this is a series A term sheet. And here we see each board committee, meaning important board committees, should include, will include one, at least one series A director. What could be, uh, what sort of committees? The uh, compensation committee? What's that? What's that committee? Uh, you need to invite. What's that? So, okay. Now, matters requiring director approval. So we'll see there's a clause in the term sheet that says matters requiring investor director approval. Now, let's look at what some of those might be. Yeah, this is all. I think it's all already on the Facebook page, but if not, so okay. So here we see like matters acquiring investor director approval. Now here's a. This is a pretty comprehensive list of the type of things that uh, that would typically require investor director approval. So we see number first one, make. Any loan or advance to, uh, or own any stock or other securities of, uh, blah, blah, blah. So this is, um, why would we want to be, um, why do we want to be able to approve that? So this is um, basically saying if the company decides to loan money to or um, invest in another company, that that needs to be approved. Um, the reason that we need to be able to approve that is this type of action that the board might take is potentially damaging to the value of the investment. Um, and then make loans or advances to employees or directors. So this is a, another typical like uh, potential abuse of the investment. Like, okay, let's think about number two. Make any loan uh, to any person, including any employee or director. So the director here is the board of directors. Yes. No, no, but board of directors is all the directors in the aggregate. In oh, no, no. Individual are called directors. Yeah, so I'm saying it's, it's the members of the board. So people think about them like the whole director. Yeah, every time you say director, it means that a director who is a member of the board. So, okay, so let's think about this for a minute, like, why would we want to approve that? What Imagine the investor invests $500,000 in the company, and right after the investor invests 500000 the board votes to loan 500000 to the CTO. Is the best land of the so the investor doesn't want that to happen, right? So this will have to be approved by investor. Next thing, um, guarantee or uh, take any in debt. 
make investment inconsistent with investment policy. Incur debt in excess of a certain amount that's not included in the budget. Enter into or be a party to any transaction with any director, so any inside transaction. Again, you know, let's say that um, the investor invests 500000 and the company decides to purchase some hardware from another company that's owned by the CEO's wife for 500000 mm -hmm. You know, So this also should be subject to investor director approval to make sure that that's a legitimate transaction and because we publish a related party transaction. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, or um, resulting in payment, uh, uh, except we might have an exception for transactions below a certain amount, and we will usually have an exception for transactions that are like this, but that are in the ordinary course of business. Um, here's another one. Uh, hire, fire, or change the compensation of executive officers. So let's say, um, the, let's go back to our $500,000 investment, um, and right after that, the executive the board votes a $500,000 bonus for the CEO. This also can happen without investor approval. Change the principal business of the company, enter new line of business, exit current line of business, so for example, the board decides to change from a technology company to a massage parlor. And this can happen without investor director approval. Unless you approve it. Yeah. And you get approval. And sell a signed license pledge or encumber the technology or intellectual property. So, yeah, that, you know, we might invest in the company and then the board sells all of the IP to a new company that includes all the existing shareholders except us. Again, this can happen without an investor approval. So um, you can see like the types of these are the types of actions that the board might take that the investor directors need to approve. So this is the Google control. This is a yeah, like this is the normal type of control that that legitimate invest the venture capital investor should ask for. Not like which is sometimes difficult to some of the needs, especially for me. So a lot of cases where the director, before you got external investors, you know, just give money to family members, and give a loan. No, no, no. It's easy. Family business, it cannot be the actual business. That's what makes it. Of the time, right? So there is, but a lot of time when, when they need to professionalize the company, that becomes a problem because the expectation of the family I know, I know is that. a problem. I know that. Yeah. Like in case if you say that, if they are still family business, cannot be the end of the world. That's that's not really the case. So. That's not really the case. It's not the case. Yeah, no, no, that's not really the case. So a lot of family businesses are actually entrepreneurs. I mean, they can be entrepreneurs. Sure, but, but, but there's many others. But I think usually it's you remember, like species, many capital investors, we normally don't like to invest in capital investors. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. So we, we use it. And, and if, if, the, if, the, if the business is a family mm -hmm. business before investment, but we're going to require the restructure everything. You know, normal corporate companies have their investments. So I think they can be entrepreneurs out there. It's very hard for them to get venture back. Okay, so now protective provisions. <coughs> protective provisions are different from the reserve matters that we just looked at. So we just looked at reserve matters, which are actions that the board might take that need to be approved by the investor director. Protective provisions are actions that the shareholders might take that need to be approved by the uh, investor shareholder. So I had a second bullet point under uh, the director that's called protective provisions. So now we're looking at, again, our term sheet alternatives document. 
which shows an example, shows examples of protective provisions that will require that will require the vote of the shareholder and the investor shareholder, not the director. So remember yesterday, we talked about the difference between directors and shareholders, and I mentioned that in our investment agreement, we're going to have protections for investor director. We're also gonna have protections for investor shareholder because the decisions made by the board and made by the shareholders may be different, or in the case where both board and shareholder need to approve some action, then uh, we, expect that the director must act in accordance with the best interests of the company, whereas the shareholder um, uh, can act in the interest of the uh, investor. So here are some of the things that would need to be approved by uh, investor shareholder. One is liquidate the company, liquidate or sell the company, to change the certificates of incorporation or bylaws, three, create new shares um, on a, with, and with rights uh, senior to or equal to our shares. Meaning, okay, well, this is a good example of what we can look at. Uh, what, um, imagine that right after we Shortly after our investment, and we, where we spend a lot of time negotiating the rights that our shares have, um, right after that, the company issues a new class of shares that have superior rights to ours. Which means that our rights can be basically invalidated. So we're going to require us, if that happens, we need to approve that. Uh, purchase or pay dividends. Um, Create a whole capital stock, increase, decrease the size of the board. So these are typical restrictions that we're going to want to have on actions that majority shareholders can take that affect the rights of minority shareholders. Is that the limits them or that's actually protecting right? This means that not, uh, shareholders cannot take any of these actions without the approval of our shareholders. Mm -hmm. So even if it's passed by majority, it doesn't matter because our shareholder needs to approve this. So 99% of the shareholders vote for this, but our shareholder votes no, it's no. All, mm -hmm. all so the same. Oh, no, not necessarily. I mean, even if like 50% 50, 50 vote for it, including our shareholder, it passes. So it just means that these specific actions that we carve out here, Require the approval of our of our shipping. So that's called um, that's called protective provisions. Um, okay, drag along agreement. Um, yeah, drag along agreement. That's what happens when you become a president. Your wife is a drag along. So drag along agreement means the investor will have the right to force the company to sell their shares at some pre-agreed point of time in the future uh, if the company hasn't been sold. So the way this usually works is the investor will say, okay, if the company has not been sold within, for example, five years of investment, and the investor finds a, a buyer for the company who wants to buy the investor shares, but only wants to buy the investor shares if they can have 100% of the company, then all the other shareholders agree to sell alongside this investor. To sell alongside? Yeah. So let's say, for example, the investor has 10%. Five years have passed, the company is not sold. I find a buyer that wants 100% of the company. He doesn't just want my 10%, he wants all. So I sell him my 10% and everybody else agrees to sell at the same time. So he gets 100%. Mm -hmm. 
If you just in this case, 100%, that's not right. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the price is uh, really the on the shelter, or just the GPU? This is in open that uh, the stock to buyer with the price, and what it costs under to uh, service this price. Yeah, everybody would sell at the same price. <laughs> so this is a, this is pretty common uh, term. The idea here is what happens if the founders never want to sell. So if the founders never want to sell, then the shares that the investor owns are worthless because the the shares the investor owns are only valuable if, if they can be sold. Mm -hmm. So if the founder doesn't want to sell, at some point investors want to be able to force the founders to sell. Mm -hmm. So all the board agreed and the founders has to agree. Oh, Dragon doesn't require any agreement. It's pre it's pre the investment phase. It's pre agreed. It's pre agreed. It's part of the investment in the So once the you know, everybody who signs the investment agreement has already agreed to the start. So what is the exact term? <laughs> oh, so let's see. We can look at some wording on this. Let's see. Okay, so here's a typical like drag along clause. So basically, this drag along clause is just saying that um, that all the other shareholders have to enter into an agreement with the company that says. Um, if uh, if the, that uh, any transaction that the investor can find that wants to buy the whole company, that the shareholders will agree to sell. Now, this is uh, this is pretty broad. So, other terms that might other parameters that usually get included into uh, a one clause like this are when can that happen? So, it might. You know, it might be the case. Uh, it might be the case that the drag along uh, does not uh, kick in until after some period of time, like maybe four or five years. If the if the shares had a redemption clause, then it would likely be the case that uh, investors would try to redeem first, and if the company couldn't redeem, then the investor would get the right to drag. But this is a, this is basically designed to make sure that the founders have strong incentive to sell the company. Now, sometimes uh, sometimes founders so you get very nervous about this, and I'm usually not that concerned about driving along buses. Like. <laughs> I think it's not as important as it sounds. The reason being, it's very difficult. Okay, it's actually in real life. It's very difficult for investors to execute drag along clauses. Mm -hmm. As in, in the cases happen that uh, the the drag along uh, agreement applied in store. I mean, I mean, does it uh, like how many times do the company do the drag along? And yeah. To, to, to sell. yeah. I don't, it's very rare. I don't know the actual number, you know, but it's very rare. So why is it very rare? Because usually, I mean, many times the company that wants to buy wants the management team. Mm -hmm. So normally in acquisition, the one of the uh, assets that's being acquired is the management team. So it's called 
when you come to buy something, 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 when you come to it's hard to make that happen because you, then the investors have to find a company that wants to buy that doesn't want the opportunity. Which can happen too. I mean, if the company, if the, you know, this would, I think most cases, this drag along would become only useful if the company was not doing it. I think uh, in case that the company is. They want to buy uh, the company with down investment deal when the company house of uh, asset like rental um return of the let's take like rental or something like this something like that asset. Oh. And they just took me to that. Yeah, where they don't really need the things. That's what we sold uh in the past like the either bots and companies. So it actually Allow the management team to go. Maybe that's one of the reasons why some of the companies that they bought are actually under. Usually, the acquiring company really wants a management team. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and then so those are the key control provisions. It's not that bad. You can see it's actually probably a lot better than five. But um, but you really have to carefully go through each agreement and understand all the rights that investors are getting. Okay, this is a table that shows dilution. I think we, we have pretty much gone over this already, so I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on this. But this just shows how dilution works um, uh, across multiple rounds. This is a cap table. So cap table is something important to understand. A cap table is a document uh, that shows the capital structure of the company. So the capital structure means who owns what, who owns how many shares, and what percentage ownership does it represent in the company. And we also want to see that in the cap table, uh, both pre and post financing. This company only has one round of financing, so the cap table is very simple. As the company raises more and more rounds of funding, the cap table will get more complex. But uh, investors uh, will be uh, always asked, will always ask to see the cap table, and they want to see, okay, who owns what now, and what will the company capital structure look like after the investment? So in this case, we had a, a seed investor coming in for, uh, for around 15%, and uh, we had an existing angel investor, and we had a the employee stock uh, tool that was set up before the investment. So before the investment, we had founders with uh, with eighty percent and uh, around eighty percent, and the remaining held by uh, angels and also uh, uh, earmarked for the tool. Now you note that uh, in this cap table, the none of the options are issued. So this means that actually everybody's percentage of shares, everybody's percentage ownership of the company is 15% greater than we see here. Because until those options are issued and exercised, they don't dilute the existing shareholders. That's the case for those. So this we, we're showing here what we call cap table on a fully diluted as converted basis, meaning it shows what would the capital structure would be like if all options that were uh, currently set aside were actually issued in exercise. You can also use the cap table to calculate the free money and post money valuation and the e share funds. So the share? I mean, no. my Okay, so. Um, now I, ha I have some slides on negotiating with investors, but actually I want to skip ahead because I want to go over some presentation tips in the last few minutes that we have. So 
Investor presentation materials. <laughs> I think everybody should have a business plan, executive summary, investor presentation, meaning PowerPoint slides, and should be prepared to do both formal and informal presentations of their business. This is really important uh, because you don't want to go into an investor pitch get interest from investors, they ask for the complete business plan, and you have to go right. Because investor interest can fade very fast. You know, if we get real investor interest, we want to move the, the deal forward quickly. So if the investor asks for a business plan, our business plan should be ready to send the next day. No, I think uh, the soft copy is okay. So, I think it's important to prepare your materials ahead of time, which is one of the reasons we keep pushing you in the class to like get your business plan done, get your business plan done. Because once you pitch to investors, if they like the idea, a lot of investors are going to ask to see the business plan, detailed business plan. So if it's not ready, they're not going to proceed. And then while you know, and they're not going to wait for you to finish it because what's going to happen is. After you don't send a business plan for like a week, they're going to forget it. And the, it's not because they don't like you, but it's because then they get new uh, companies come in and pitch, and they get excited about those. So, yeah, you don't want to lose uh, your opportunity because you didn't have materials prepared. Having materials prepared is so easy. Like, so many things that we need to do in this business are really, really hard. Like. Getting customer traction is hard. You know, convincing investors is hard. And beating the competition is hard. Preparing investment materials is easy. <laughs> yeah, and so we should just we should just do it because we want it, if we're gonna fail, we want to fail because we couldn't do the hard things, not because we screwed up the easy things. So yeah, get your materials done, have them in shape, always ready to go, and then you have to keep them updated too. Because when an investor asks you for the business plan, and you say, oh, I have to update it, and then, update it, okay. and then you go back and update it, how, how long does it take? So, you know, this is like, a, let's say when you're selling, everybody's selling, right? So let's say you have a customer who's ready to, really excited about the deal. What do you want to do? Send a yeah, do you want to make, do you want to make them wait for two weeks while you draw up the contract? No, right. It's the last thing you want. So you want to have everything ready to go and perfect so that you uh, in the you know, because what happens is you talk to a lot of investors and many of them are not, not going to be interested. When you hit one that's interested, you want to go to boom, 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 close the deal. Mm -hmm. If you don't close the deal relatively fast, it's not going to close. So how yeah. fast is it? I mean. I mean, if you put, no, no. If you don't maintain the momentum in the deal, it's very rare it's going to close. So I shouldn't say fast. But if, well, once the deal process loses momentum, then it's very rare that those deals close. So you don't want to lose momentum at any stage in the deal process. So if you have, uh, well, just the time to do it. Okay. So how long to the term sheet? Maybe a week? Something? Two weeks? From what point? First presentations, first contact, the first agreement. Oh, the first contact to term sheet is, let's say, two months. Two months. And then we have another 30 to 90 days. So the whole process is six to nine months. No, six to nine months. It's like you're having a baby or anything. Yeah. First contact to check in the bank. How do you get to six to nine months? If you have like two months, when you have another 30 to 90 days, that's five months max. So two months plus five months is how much? No, no, it's five months. So my 30 to 90 days, two months plus three months is how much? Five months. And so let's, yeah, so let's say, let's look at, let's uh, do an example. So right now it's November 15th. So let's say we decide to start reaching out to investors today. Okay, we're going to, our materials are done, we're ready to go. So we're going to send out, let's see, when are we going to get our check in the back? Let's talk about December. Let's 
start from the same Okay, so start from the same you pitch to investors on December 10th. So let's look at when will the check be in the bank. So, okay, December 10th, you need a bunch of investors, business card, blah, blah, blah. Next step is what? Next step is arranging meeting. I'm arranging meeting to go pitch in the office. So, when will that meeting take place? That meeting is going to take That meeting will take place earliest, the second week in January. Because it's already December 10th. So by the time we try to schedule a meeting, like nobody's gonna go uh, starting like around the third week of December until the second week of January, everybody's gonna take on it. So it's gonna be very hard to get meetings the rest of December. And so probably you'll get your first meeting in the second week of January. When are the holidays here? Um, 25, 25 January. Okay, so now you get your first meetings in the second and third week of January. And then everybody goes away for the, the tech holidays, right? <laughs> so now we're in the second week of February before we get to second week. Then we go back for second meeting, okay, second week in February. Then uh, maybe some investors are interested, and now we start getting asked to send a little more material. This takes us to the end of February. Then we're in early March. So by, let's say, by the second week in March, we actually get a term sheet from some investor. Then we have to negotiate the terms in the term sheet. This will take, let's say, at least another two weeks. That brings us to the end of March. Then let's say we get a signed term sheet at the beginning of April. Now we have, let's say, a typical 60-day exclusivity period for detailed due diligence. So that's April, May. Now we're at the beginning of June. Once the exclusivity period has finished, now we go to the final documents. So through the final documents, it's going to take at least another four to six weeks, which puts us in the middle of July. And now we have final documents, okay, we can sign, and then that probably takes another two weeks until the money is in the bank. Uh, so actually, we do the closing and the money is fired. So now it's first week in August. So we went from December 10th to first week in August, which is almost on So, uh, but normally, uh, when they, they after the end of December, so usually, like, okay, they'll, uh, they'll probably want you to come into the office and pitch, and then if they're interested after that, they'll ask for a more detailed assistance. Mm -hmm. So in the office, is it the formal pitch or informal pitch? Mm -hmm. Formal pitch. Yeah, so I call formal pitch. We go into pitch with PowerPoint slides for a VC or a VC investment committee. So another thing that can happen is, you go in and pitch to one VC, then they like the idea, and then you'll have to come back and pitch for the investment committee, where the real vote takes place. Right. Investment committees may meet, our investment committee meets every week, but sometimes investment committees may be only every two weeks, or maybe even once a month. This can add more time to the cycle. So, okay, so sometimes it happens faster. Sometimes it might happen three to six months, but safe is to estimate it's going to be minimum six months. What the uh, what the uh, documents uh, investor they always need to to you know to check the evaluation. For example, contract investor. So later, yeah, later in the detailed due diligence, they're going to want to see contracts with customers. Yes. They're going to want to see bank statements. Uh -huh. They're going to want to see the financial the accounts if you have accounts. They're going to want to see the employment contracts between the company and the employees. Mm -hmm. They're, they may want to talk to some customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so once you get to the detail due diligence, the investors will check a lot of the claims you made in the business. Mm -hmm. So make sure there's nothing more connected to that good in the business. So, but we never know how this is going to be in the, in the stage. Write a whole business plan with everything. Yeah. 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 I mean, nobody is asking you to know. That's why it's called a business plan. It's not a business, you know, right. see the future, right? right? The business plan is about what you plan to do. You must have a plan, right? If, if you don't have a plan, don't admit that you don't have a plan. Like, just develop. That this, you know, otherwise, you know, 
that if what if we don't speak to that plan, we can speak to that plan that I change. You never speak to the plan. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, nobody expects you to stick 100% to the point. Mm -hmm. So, the plan is what you are, what are you raising the money for? What, you, why are you, what are you going to do with this money? What is the plan that you intend to execute with this money? That's the plan. So, plan is not predicting the future. Plan is what you intend to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some suggestions on your presentations. I like to I like to use meaningful slide titles. Meaning I like I like to have simple slides and meaningful titles. So investors can very quickly understand what I'm trying to communicate on each slide. And um, and I, again I like to have simple slides with a clear message for each slide. Yeah. So just for this, some quick presentation tips. Like, how long does it take to make the first impression? Three seconds. Yeah, maximum seven seconds. That's <laughs> massive. Yeah. So within seven seconds, every investor that you meet will have formed their first impression of you. Oh, whatever. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a lot of subconscious. So, and the, you know, like, uh, very important to note about first impression is the impress first impressions are formed very quickly and they almost never change. Mm -hmm. So whatever somebody's first impression of you is, it's going to be their impression forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so so that, what does it mean? It's good, you must make a good first impression. I'm going to go through some of the It's like an interview. So, this is just some general tips. When you're presenting uh, to investors, you need to avoid raising red flags. So, what do I mean by avoid raising red flags? Don't, um, you don't want to signal that there's something wrong with you or wrong with the business plan. Did I mention this about, uh, I was, I went to the Tech Fest, uh, sure. and, and one of the entrepreneurs had a question from one of the investors, uh, which I thought was a very valid question. And at first I was really impressed with the product and the idea, but then the, the way that the entrepreneur answered the question from the investor was very defensive. Very defensive. So at that point, I became much less interested in the company. Because to me, like when the entrepreneur is highly defensive in answering questions, that is a red flag. It's a, a danger, danger signal, warning signal. Avoid this investment. What did you do? What did he say when he said So, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go into the detail yet as we're you know, reporting, but I tell you. <laughs> but, but basically, it was defensive, and uh, I think you don't want to sound, you don't want to be defensive in front of investors. Also, very important is pay attention to detail, and um, I think entrepreneurs that make presentations and don't pay attention to detail, like for example, there's a spelling error in the slides. So you would think a spelling error is pretty small, right? But actually, I think it's not small. I wonder, like, when I see entrepreneurs presenting with spelling errors in their slides or a uh, radical error or some uh, formatting error, I just wonder, uh, it makes me think, you know what, this entrepreneur, they can't even create a uh, a good PowerPoint stock. How are they going to create a hundred million dollar company? If you can't even do that, how can you do the bigger thing? So I think this is a lot of investors think like that. So you should make sure that you get the small things right. Again, this is another area where getting the small things right is it easy or difficult? Easy. Easy. But it's also easy to fail because we didn't get the small things right. So I think 
we have to we have to do so many difficult things to succeed in our business. We want to make sure that the easy things we have to do we get right every time. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. You know, I've been using these slides for many years, so way before. So uh, presentation choking is something that affects some entrepreneurs. Uh, so you have to be. Uh, this is something you can uh, help to address by preparing. So if you are prepared for what to do if you discover yourself in presentation choking, then you won't suffer from this. Um, this usually happens, people choke in presentations when they start thinking about their own performance during the presentation. So the way that this typically happens is, an entrepreneur is presenting, they make a mistake. And then they start to think about the fact that they made a mistake. And they get worried. And this causes them to make another mistake. And then they think about the fact that they made another mistake. And pretty soon the whole presentation can become a mess. So the key thing here is, um, if you make a mistake, just, just move on. It doesn't matter. You know, just go on to the next thing and don't start thinking about the fact that you made a mistake. In, in golf, we have a name for this. We call it, forget about your bad shots. So the same thing happens to golfers. They they hit a bad shot. You know, they hit many good shots in a row, and then they hit a bad shot. And then when they stand over the ball in the next shot, they're thinking about that bad shot. And then they hit a second bad shot. And then they're standing over the ball a third time, and they're thinking about the last two bad shots. And they, so the advice we always have in golf is forget about a bad shot. Think about your you know visualize your good shot and something. So same thing in presentation, you make a mistake, okay, forget it. Visualize yourself making an excellent presentation. <laughs> make sure your friend is sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, anything that helps you to get uh, past that. And then I always like to have a clear takeaway message from my presentations. So I know what I want people to remember from the presentation and make sure that that comes through clearly. Um, I think it's one thing that makes a very bad presentation is reading your PowerPoint slides. This, when this happens to me, when, when I have an entrepreneur come in to pitch us and the reading from PowerPoint slides, I'm ready to just be anywhere but here. How about, uh, okay, during the presentation, actually we already have the, the slide, but we don't need the slide to go uh, through and just stay there and I think it's good to have slides and not just talking because it's hard for, if you're covering a lot of the topics, it's hard for the audience to cover everything to, to um, it's hard for the audience to catch everything you're trying to say if there's one slide. So what I usually would try to do, you can see I do here, right? I have a slide, but I don't talk about everything on the slide. I, I, the slide helps you remember what's my topic. And then also you might see one or two points on the slide. So I would try to use the slides that way. I, would, I think that if the presentation is short enough, you can do without slides. So yeah, let's say five minutes or three minutes, you probably don't need slides. But something like ten minutes or more, I would use slides. There's some kind of there's some 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 points in the slide. Oh, there are some slides we can we can pass over to come into the key points. Yeah, yeah, definitely don't cover every point in the slide. And. Practice and test is really important. I think like bad product demos are a terrible way to make an impression in the presentation. Like when you try to demo the product and it fails or it doesn't work right, this uh, this makes a very strong impression on the investors and it's not a good impression. Um, and another thing that okay, another pet complaint that I have is entrepreneurs that that can make the technology work. So I think I talked about this earlier in the in our accelerator program, but you know, the entrepreneur comes in to pitch and they can't even connect their laptop to the projector. You know what I mean? Like they they can't get the image from the laptop onto the screen. Like again, simple things. Like I think wow, somebody who can't do that, what else can they do? You know, somebody who's not prepared enough to handle that, what else are they not prepared enough to do? You know, so I think, and you think about it, first, imagine if we go back to our first impression. So when, you know, when the first impression that you make on the investor is, I 
can't even connect my laptop to the projector, you know, what is the message that that sends? It's not good. So you test and make sure everything works before you go. Now another important thing is sometimes sometimes we test everything, we prepare everything, and still we have technical problems. So what do we do in that case? In that case, I think don't wait for the technology. Don't spend too much time trying to fix things because that puts you in the position of not working. So like for me, okay, if I can't get my laptop to project somehow, then just start presenting without the laptop and let somebody else try to fix the laptop. I mean, one idea I have too is if you're doing enough presentations, it might be worth it to get a small projector. Now there, you know, you can buy like Pico projectors which fit in your pocket that you can connect to your computer. So if I was doing enough presentations, I would get one. That was a really lot of like, you know, sometimes when I was getting into classes, that you could teach, you know, simple thing with technology, you use your character with technology, but simple things in technology sometimes don't work. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't, and I wouldn't be able to figure out because I'm so focused on, you know, getting the class done and thinking about the messages and all of that. And it's just very hard sometimes to, uh, yeah. You know, they, they, you know, the simple things that you learn every day you would solve it in seconds. Suddenly you would spend one minute and you couldn't figure out because you know, it's not in the right yeah, space. Agree. But if that happens when teaching, it's okay. But it happens in presentation, it's No, the fact is, okay, that these things happen. So, what you need to do is always to avoid it and work around. It's quick as possible. That's the message. Agree. And then my last point on presentation is question and answer. So, Actually, the most important part of every presentation is question and answer session. And this, I was alluding to this before. You know, I felt uh, an entrepreneur that did a, what I thought was good presentation, but I became totally uninterested when they couldn't handle the question and answer. So, uh, how do you handle question and answer? Uh, you should be not defensive. You should be not arguing with investors. You should be basically uh, able to handle any question that gets thrown at you. You should be able to answer coolly and calmly every question, and you should avoid getting either defensive or argumentative. So I think that to me is the most effective uh, way to answer your question and answer. Okay, so I'm gonna, you'll all have a chance to demonstrate these skills in tomorrow's session, because tomorrow we're gonna do the practice presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to interrupt us?